welcome to um, uh, Quarantine Historians, maybe or maybe not drinking coffee. It started out as drinking coffee and then right. um, it morphed last year. Okay. I am still drinking coffee right now. Yeah. Well, see, Chris and I always started the day at the Wolf House with, with a Coke. And we ended the day with a Coke back in my office discussing what neither we were going to do or what in the afternoon, what needed to be done. So uh, we were, we bookend our, our, uh, our day with, with Coca-Cola. So I still continue that, that, that tradition. Um, well, my name is Steve Hill and I was the site manager uh, of the Thomas Wolf house from actually March of 1979 until the end of December of 2011. So 34 plus years about 34 and a half. So a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I grew up in Asheville. So I always grew up hearing about Thomas Wolf, And it was always that that local interest type thing. But mm -hmm. I always loved history. And, uh, you know, my, my parents indulged me on that would take me to a lot of the different places. Uh, you know, is on vacations and everything we'd go to, to Myrtle Beach, and we wind up at Brook Green Gardens. And we went to Expo 67 and, you know, my favorite part of it wasn't Expo 67. It was Fort Ticonderoga and, and this type of thing. So, you know, we'd go to Winston-Salem and then we would go visit family and we'd wind up at Old Salem with Berthabra and that type of thing. And they always, you know, they always indulge me on that. And uh, in school, grammar school, whatever, um, I never was very good at things like math, really hated it. Uh, but the history part of it was what I always enjoyed. You know, I endured the rest of the school day to get to the history class. But I had a teacher there that uh, his name was Bill Culbreth. And he kind of followed my career all the way through would even come to the Wolf House and see me even in, in you know, my uh, my years there at the Wolf House. Uh, but he always realized that I was interested in history. And at lunch, he would always come up to the table and say, you asked some really good questions in history class this morning. Why don't we go down to the library and I'll help you find, you know, the books that you can read that'll help you answer those questions. And then you can you can talk to the class about it tomorrow. But when I was in high school, uh, you, know, you start thinking about well, what am I going to do for college? Mm -hmm. And there was one day that I was looking at some Southern Living magazines and uh, there was an article about Dr. Harley Jolly. And that one, it said that he was uh, took a, a non-traditional look at, at, the, at the classroom and would take his classes out to uh, historic sites and this type of thing uh, to, to learn, to, you know, to learn about history. And that really intrigued me. And so when I got out of Asheville High, I went to Mars Hill literally because of Dr. Jolly. And I took a lot of classes under Dr. Jolly, uh, Dr. Lindbergh and Dr. Jolly. And um, but anyway, I would have to say that it was Dr. Jolly that really was the one that, that uh, cemented, uh, if that's a term, uh, my interest in history. Um, when I finished, well, during during my years at Mars Hill, he got me an internship up at, at the Thomas Wolf House. Uh, there were three of us that, that did that. And uh, under uh, we worked with Bob Conway that used to be with historic sites. And so I, I kind of had my foot in the door with that. And I uh, found that I really enjoyed it. And uh, that was strictly just the interpretive part of it. I didn't see anything with the management end of it at that time. And then, um, let's see, February of 1978, just before I got out of college, I happened to, to wreck my car out on 1923. It needed money uh, to, to start replacing the car. So I wandered into Vance birthplace and uh, talked to Sudi Wheeler. And Larry Meisenheimer were the first two people I talked to with historic sites. And uh, Sudi hired me part time at Advanced Birthplace in February of 1978. And I worked there that spring and that summer. And that's when it wasn't long after they, they state had already acquired the Wolf House, but it wasn't fleshed out yet. And right. so uh, in August of 78, uh, I went to the Wolf House as a, a historic interpreter. And uh, the manager that was there at that time uh, uh, decided that he wanted to move on to something else. So I came up with the job of manager in, in March of 1979. So and literally I was I was a kid, you know, it's it's it, it I, w I was too, I guess, too immature at that time to realize, you know, what I had kind of acquired 
and bitten off. I didn't realize what all it was going to be. An interesting time in my early career uh, is, to, is to take a historic site that basically was brand new and start bringing it along. And so it, it was, it was uh, gosh, it was very rewarding to do that. And, uh, and you know, you know, then you wake up one morning and you've been there for 35 years. So, you know, it, it did go by fast. It really did. It, it really, it, it, it was shocking how fast it went. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Steve, <laughs> you started working at the Thomas Wolf House before I was born. <laughs> yeah, I've heard it before. I'm sure, I've heard it before. I'm sure you have. Now, yeah. you know, I do generally pick my mugs based on who I'm going to be talking to. I think I put way too much thought behind them, but I picked <laughs> this specific little mermaid mug and it's because yeah. I've bought this mug at Disney World when I was a child and I was looking at my mugs and I was like this mug I bought this and Steve was already working at the Tom's World House. House. Thank you. Well I made the mistake of taking Chris Morton to a program one time that I was going to do uh, for a group and it was like my own heckler that I brought with me you know every time I'd say something about something Chris would say I was in the third grade you know, or I wasn't born yet when you were starting this. And I stopped the program. I said, you know, okay, all right. We know I'm old. So, you know, knock it off. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Dr. Jolly, you know, Dr. Jolly just passed away here not too terribly long ago. Um, he was almost a hundred when he, well, he was a hundred when he died. And uh, I just, when, when he died, I stopped and thought about what all I would not have done, what I had, what I did had it not been for Dr. Jolly. Uh, not only with my education at Mars Hill, but everything that he did for me um, uh, to get me, you know, help me get a job with the department. Uh, yeah. And he did work hard at it. Uh, and, you know, Kimberly, things weren't going well and I had a bad day or your things weren't going particularly good. I would always see Dr. Jolly and he would always, you know, sit down and, and, and talk to me about all of it. And uh, he he would always say this too shall pass. I would be interested to know a little bit about, you know, what it was like working for historic sites like in the eighties in the nineties, because I feel like at Vance, a lot of times people refer to it as the heyday. It's like the heyday of historic yeah. sites. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, what's that mean? Well, back in those days, they were coveted jobs. You know, and be it an interpreter job or one of the management jobs. Um, don't know exactly what is what it is like now, but back in those days, we would have 32, 33,000 people a year go through the Wolf House. It was busy. And I mean, and we had very little staff, but it was busy. But we were happy busy. Uh, you know, the, the days were filled. Um, Might have been the manager. But you function. We were so busy. You functioned more as as a historical interpreter. That was the first line, and whatever I did as management came along as a, as a second part of it. Um, you know, as as the Wolf House grew along, we got the visitor center in the late nineties, and then of course the fire in nineteen ninety eight kind of uh, changed the whole profile of the place. Um, and and my job changed at that particular point in time. It it, it went from being uh, kind of the purveyor of, of, of knowledge to that, to fighting for the survival of the site. So from 1998 on until I left, uh, that last part of my career was much different as, than, than, than the early part. But I think that my best years at the Wolf House were those years that we didn't have the visitor center, that we all worked out of that one tiny little room uh, in the front of the house. Um, mm -hmm. I, if somebody asked me, when did you do your best work? I think it was those early years. That, that just felt very right. Mm. For people who are watching it who might not know about the fire at Wolf, give a little bit of background on that. And then I'd just be interested to know, you know, you mentioned like surviving and keeping it open after that, you know, what that process was like. Um, well, the fire was, it's been a long time ago now, you know, it, was it is. 1998. And uh, I'm curious now when people go through the Wolf House, if that's a question that they ask or whether it's been so far, you know, there's, there's the, the recency effect of that is gone. And I always wondered what they know about it. Um, but, you know, Wolf House uh, was acquired from the from the Wolf family um, almost directly. And it led to the fact that the house 
and everything in it was almost intact. There was very little that that had changed. Uh, and it was one of the things that was was kind of the selling point of that place. I mean, you would you would go through there. There were even boxes in some of the the, the uh, bureaus upstairs, Whitney, that had the kids um, like hair still in you know, where Julia would take, you know, cut off their hair when they were a kid and put in a box and it was labeled Ben and Tom. That was all still in the boxes upstairs. I mean, it's it's it just used to give me the kind of the, you know an eerie feeling about you know you just felt like they had just stepped out of the place, you know. And I always had that that sense of it, and I think the visitors did too. And I think it was part of the attraction of it. Um, all the furniture was original. There was very little that had been changed. Um, in 1998, July 24th of 1998, it was during the Bell Share program that. Um, an arsonist set fire to the house and that fire did uh, 2.8 million. I think it was $2.8 million worth of damage to the house. Uh, literally there was not one piece of, of the historic fabric of the house. It was not affected in some shape, form or fashion. Right. And uh, you know, Chris Morton and I stood there that night and literally watched it burn air and we, we didn't verbalize it, but we had to wonder, you know, what's this going to do? Uh, you know, to the, to the history of the house, yeah. you know, can we survive this? Are we going to have jobs? And yeah. uh, so it took six years to get it back, uh, pack open. Um, and of course the, the house looked great. There were a lot of things that were done to the house during that point in time that, that would lead to its long-term preservation. But there was always a part of it that disappeared that I, that I never got over losing. Now that, that sense of, you know, the Wolf family just stepping out of it um, was gone. And it went more from being, I think, a historic house to, to being a museum. And, and it, there's a difference at that point. And so I was, I was never as comfortable wearing that house after, after we reopened as I was prior to the fire. It, there, was, there was something in me that went out with it as well that I never recovered. Um, I, it was one of the most terrifying things that I saw happen that night, but I've got to sit back and think that uh, I did not realize how well the Wolf House was respected uh, because in the aftermath of that, we got all kind of help uh, in, the, in the immediate aftermath from like built more of the park service, uh, Carl Sandburg home, the parkway, uh, individuals coming by and leaving, you know, $30,000 checks with us and that type of thing to cover what, what we needed. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, all the staff from the Biltmore house came that Rick King, that was the site manager or the house manager of the house that time sent all of his, uh, con his, you know, his conservation crew to us. Uh, they were the ones that really took the lead and, and, you know, doing the triage on the house that morning. And it kind of set the pace, I think on, on the rest of the, on the rest of the restoration. Um, it was, I met some of the, the nicest, most talented people, uh, in the course of that restoration that you would ever hope to meet. And that kind of, uh, I think that Chris would agree with me on this is, is that what kind of got us through was the backing that, that everybody had. Uh, I know Pat Conroy did a, a benefit. He and Wilma Dykeman did a benefit for us, uh, at the civic center one night. And after it was over, <clears throat> I was standing on the back of the house just standing there looking at this, this hulking hat thing that loomed over me and thought, what are we going to do? And uh, I thought I was standing there by myself and I didn't realize that Pat Conroy was standing behind me and he gets me up in a bear hug and he says, this is going to be okay. We're going to get this fixed. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. I'm so that's what kept us. That's what provided the drive to get us through it. And uh, yeah. you know, it, it really was, and it was interesting to do, but it wasn't a day went by that I wished that it wasn't back the way that it was. Yeah. It was always yeah. the, I mean, when it happens to you on your watch, yeah. it feels like that you're responsible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was, I think one of the things that we were, we were supposed to take all the furniture out of the house and put alarm systems in it on September the 1st of 1998. We had worked on that project for years and had acquired like $400,000 to do work to the house. We were that close. Yeah. And when this happened and, you know, it's just like, uh, I think the one of the things that, that really got me back in those years is we did a radio uh, program. And one of the gentlemen that was in that program said, 
to me, <clears throat> you're the manager, right? And I, yes, sir. And he says, so if you do the extension on that, can it be said that this, this lies at your feet to this happen to the house? And, you know, because it didn't have what it needed, you know, to, to protect it. And, you know, it, it just, I mean, it shocked me to, to hear that. I already felt guilty enough, you know, right. that, and Rob Boyette said, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing you could have done. You, you were doing what you could do. And he says, it's just, it's just what happened. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, but, but that statement that he made to me during that live radio broadcast, you know, still rings in my ears to this day. And, uh, you know, I felt like that I realized that where our deficiencies were and I was trying desperately to get them corrected. And, and we had, I just ran out of time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was a defining, it, it was, it was one of those defining moments in your life, you know, and, oh, sure. and even I, I, I guess I would fair to say that I, that I never got over it. You know, I, I just never have really fully uh, have recovered from that, that it, um, I had taken the, the, the 23rd of July was my birthday and I had family in town. So I took off early that afternoon uh, to go and eat dinner with them. And I came home and I was uh, about two o'clock in the morning. My phone rang. Forget exactly what time. Fire department said, Mr. Hill, there's a fire at the Wolf House. And I said, well, how bad is it? And there was this long, horrible pause. So it went on forever. And he says, you just better get downtown. And uh, so anyway, I got down really fast. And when I turned the corner, you could see flame coming through the through the roof in the night sky. And I just thought, this is done. And uh, there's never anything that shocked me more when daylight came and the fire department pulled back from it and turned it over to us that we walked through it, that you could walk through every room of it with the exception of the dining room. The roof was gone. It reminds you of a dollhouse that somebody had taken the roof off of and you could see down in it. Um, and, you know, we immediately got some structural engineers to take a look at it and because I, I, I want to know well what am i up against you know right. what if what do i tell people so we had engineers look at it and they said what's here is 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 good and uh you know joe opperman was our restoration architect on that and in one of the early meetings we had i said this has got to be the worst thing you've ever worked on he says no this isn't bad at all he said you're in good shape and it was like a switch snapped at me at that time to kind of get rid of just the, the, all the gloom and doom that I was sitting in and thought, well, if the architect says it can be done and he's done this many times in his career, then, then I'm going to go with that. Not that it wasn't depressing and not that it wasn't exhausting. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, it, it, by golly, we did it. And, uh, it took, it took six years and, uh, two point, I think it's 2.6 or $2.8 million, but we, but we got it back. And, I can remember the day where they brought the tractor trailers of the furniture back in and Martha Battle Jackson was getting ready to retire um, after 40 years. I thought I did a good job 40 years, um, <laughs> but they brought all that furniture back in and sat in the house. And I just sat there that night when everybody left, sat there and walked those halls and sat in the dining room and think, this is really cool. Yeah. And uh, this is all back. And, you know, we recovered almost everything back in that house. Kimberly, except for what was what what was destroyed in the dining room, so right. with all that, we got most of it back. That's and uh, Julie Bledsoe was walking in the house that day with a Coke cola in her hand, and Chris yelled at her, "No, no, no drinks in the house!" And the place was still smoking. You know, it's like you know, you know never lost, never lost our humor through it. And uh, <laughs> no drinks in the house. No drinks in the house. There's no but roof, I, but I, no I, drinks in the house. No, no <laughs> drinks in the house, and I still think that. That morning, the visitor center, of course, we were in the visitor center and this guy walks in, or fire department's there, smoke's rolling out of the house, everybody's pulling hoses around. He says, what time is the next tour? <laughs> and, and well, I can't remember who it was. Uh, he says, well, try 2004. And, you know, it, it was spot on. That's when it was. And it's like, you know, come on, man, the house is sitting here with that roof burn off of it. You know, when's the next tour? 2004. Yeah. And they were right. I think it was Lee Gardner said it. And, uh, that's that was it was yeah and you had you had to laugh at it i mean you couldn't do anything else but you know we we kind of kept our humor through it all i will say that in the years after the fire uh when christian was there and, and chris and and patrick willis and and folks like that and ted that i was blessed with a really good staff and kim hewitt and everything that you were blessed with a good staff and so that was the reward for a lot of it was all how well it went and in, in the years afterwards um 
Well, I actually have this memory of, it was when I, I was the interpreter at Stagville and I had been invited to go to a manager's meeting. I don't remember what it was, but it was in Raleigh. Yep. Um, and I, I was obviously, I was in Durham. So, but I went without my site manager at the time. And um, it was the first time I'd ever been to a manager's meeting for the division. And they had invited interpreters and assistant site managers and all that from all the sites. So it was like a bigger meeting than normal. Right. And I remember I was sitting there and everybody was ready to go. And like the West like rolled in right before it started. And I remember it was, I vividly remember Chris and Christian. I don't, there were more people in the group. I can't remember who I was there, but I remember they rolled in right before it started. You could tell they like skidded in on the car, you yeah. know, made it to the meeting and they come rolling in they're sitting down they're talking. And I was like, they seem really fun. I want to hang out with them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they were. Oh Yeah how it's, the tours change and kind of the interpretation or if it did um, while you were there. The, the tours became more complex and, and more uh, maybe subject uh, specific subject oriented as we went through each guide uh, would our historic inter interpreter would have, I think uh, something they were particularly interested in and they would flesh that out and make that, you know, their own. So everybody kind of owned their own tour. And, you know, m as a manager, my attitude was you can, you can develop this any way that you want to, but I want it to come from, you know, documented sources. And you got to remember this was long before the internet. Yeah. So, I mean, it literally meant going and, and getting a book and opening and, and studying, you know, and, and working your tour from resources. You know, there was, there was, um, and those there's, there's no, there was no internet. Um, and so um, the, the tours did evolve over the time and became, I think, you know, a little more sophisticated, if I can use that term. Uh, and, and I think that we became more adept at, at, uh, at targeting the group that was there and finding what they were interested in and talking mm -hmm. to that point. Right. Uh, and I think that it, that it made it a, a really special historic site because it, the, it was the, a lot of the, the, the tours were tailor were tailor made, uh, and you had to be well read enough. Um, you know, of course, any of the sites that you go to, there's the in depth stuff that you rarely get to, but we seem to get into that almost on a daily basis. A lot of the people that came to the Wolf House would come with very dog eared copies of Look Homeward Angel. And they would say, they would open it to a particular passage and they would read it. And they would say, I want you to take me to where this happened. And I just want to stand there. I don't want you to talk. I just want to stand here and read this passage where this took place. And that was not an unusual thing that happened. That happened time and time and time again. So we had a lot of people that, uh, you know, in, in the aftermath of the fire, we would get telephone calls and say, is the room where Ben died? okay and that type of oh, thing yeah. so uh there were there were people that had uh read wolf all their lives that were very much in tune to that house so um i will say that you I, your name comes up a lot in <laughs> historic oh, sites no. but it comes up as like steve hills the person who like gave his all he worked so hard he's just yeah. like the person and um the epitome of site managers and historic sites and so i I, I I feel better that that's what they say uh because i used to give it i think sometimes people got me wrong because a lot of times i would go in and and, and poor bob rimsburg uh you know i used to say bob when we have these these manager meetings, do you take this stuff to Raleigh and and and, and talk to him about it? Or do you just forget about it? And you know, poor Bob, I, I, it's like it's like you know, we, we kind of gave Bob a bad time sometimes, and and he 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 shouldered it all so well. Oh, yeah, he was he was great to work. He was great to work with and for. Well. You, um, let's just say, you know, people say you worked really hard. You were honest. You were very yeah. open and honest. <laughs> Blunt. But, 
you blunt is another way of putting it. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I was going to ask you, I got this question from a history college student. Um, gosh, it's been a, a little over a year ago now. It was right before the pandemic. I was speaking on this career panel and a student asked me, how do you avoid burnout in your field? <laughs> burnout or like, burnout? <laughs> well, you, we had humor to do it with. Uh, you know, we did a program one time. Rob Boyette bought all the managers one time a book called Who Moved My Cheese? <laughs> and we had to do a program down there one time on the fire. So I changed it. Was, it was a, a PowerPoint program. And we had all the graphics with uh, mice coming to get the cheese. And it was all on fire. And, it, and, the, and the presentation was Who Burnt My Cheese? And uh, so, you know, we would do that. And um, if you're really interested in your subject, there's always something new to go do. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not get really tired. Um, probably by 2009 or 2010, I, can't really, I felt like it began to creep in around the peripheral on me that I had done everything that I could do. Uh, that I didn't know what else, uh, and I did not know what else to do for the place at that particular time. And it finally dawned on me one day, well, maybe you're done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have been here at that time, 34 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember on September the 15th, I came to the lobby of the, of the house, of the visitor center, and it just fell on me like a ton of bricks. You, you need to go. And you're, you're done. You're now to the point where you're hurting the place rather than, than helping it. And that was never my intention. And I remember going to get Chris and I said, you and I need to take a quick ride. And I told him, I said, when I get back in, I'm putting my papers in. It was September the 15th. And, uh, and uh, I said, I just, I'm just done. And uh, so I really felt like that I had a lot to offer, it, but I knew when it was time to go. And I never have liked people that overstayed their usefulness and i was about and i was about to do that and i may have i may have stayed beyond that i uh, hope i didn't but it was time to do I, I got to a point where it was time to go mm -hmm. well nobody has ever said that to me that you so stayed probably thought it but they're too kind to say it <laughs> so you say that it was a fight what made it a fight uh, it, it, on getting on getting it on getting the house back or, mm -hmm. or the um well it's never when when you're working with a project like that uh, uh it, it's like all your your state rules and regulations and everything which have to be followed really were quite in our way to some degree when you're trying to do a restoration uh, because there's always not three companies that produce, you know, quarried <laughs> slate roofs that came from the same quarry that their original slate came from. Right. Or, you know, you had an insurance company that said, well, we would like to put up plaster or put up sheetrock rather than three part plaster. There's a lot of people that would say, well, Steve restored the house. Steve didn't. Steve yeah. had so many, literally hundreds of people uh, that were working to do that. But I think where my fight came was was to keep it an honest restoration where there were not corners cut. Uh, the house was on the National Register, and I wanted to have that same uh, feel when it, we finished it, when we started. Uh, but there were times where it could have gone very wrong. I know that um, uh, we had a, a, a contractor that was putting down flooring upstairs, and when we took everything up, it was taken up and numbered, you know, so we would know where to put it back down. Well, this person got it backwards and it installed it wrong. And I had walked over that floor like 10 million times and I knew what went where. And I said, this is wrong. We're going to have to take it up and do it over again. And well, I'm not doing it. And I said, it actually you are. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't have the authority to do it, but I went and found the, the people that could, could make it work. And so, you know, it's it was like I just kind of stood guard over the place when it was being done, because this is this is not bragging, but there was nobody knew the house as thoroughly as I knew the house. I had I had start, I had been with it since I was basically a kid and had seen it every day of my life. 
-hmm. and I knew it inside and out. And that was information that you couldn't write it down. You couldn't convey it to anybody. You had to stand there and look at it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's just what I was doing because I would go into the house every day and, and think, I've got to be sure they do this right. And mm -hmm. so I didn't restore it, but I was kind of the, the uh, moral compass for it, I think. Right. Yeah. I was like a favorite memory um, with a guest or visitor. Do you have like some that stick out to you? Um, for some reason, this one sticks in my brain. Um, and I know you've seen this, but we used to get to five o'clock and somebody would always come in like at four, 59, 30. <laughs> and they would come in and they would say, well, we're here just under, I mean, you're always tired. And so anyway, uh, I had this one guy came in and uh, he uh, said, I've, I've drove all the way from California to see this. And it's like, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Yep. <laughs> You're like, did you, did you drive but, all the way from California? <laughs> yeah. And, but anyway, on this particular day, there was just something different about this yeah. than that, that I, it just felt different. And I was tired. It'd been, it was a, it was in a summer day. It was, you know, no air conditioning in the house. It was hot. I was worn out, but for some reason this day said, well, I've got to finish up one thing that I've got to get, you know, onto the fax machine and get down to Raleigh because I'm already late with it. They're already writing me about it. I need to get this finished. If you'll let me finish this. Then I'll take you through. And you know, the other staff, the other staff says, you know, I said, y'all go. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll take care of this. Yeah. So the guy um, said, OK. So he sat on the front porch and waited for me. Oh. And so we, we about 520. We started. We finished at eight o'clock. Oh. And I mean, uh, and he asked questions I had never heard anybody ask before. And uh, when we got done, he says, I've long been a student. Thomas Wolf. he says, I will have to tell you that I've never had been treated with the hospitality that, that, that I've had here. And so he pulled out his checkbook and wrote a really big check for the advisory committee and gave us, and I didn't do it for the money. I had no idea that we were going to get that, but I always just thought, you know, you never know who you're talking to. Uh, you never know what they'll do, but this guy was sincere about it. You know, he got in there by the skin of his teeth and, you know, I was so glad that I didn't turn him away could have yeah. uh but but that one you know and and i had several people kind of like that but that one particularly sticks in my sticks in my sticks in my brain yeah. and because that time of day it's easy to to be dismissive of people but there was something that day i just thought well i need to reach down and, and do this i didn't always do that there were some of course i said i'm sorry we're closed <laughs> that particular one and he was particularly nice and he would write letters to me for for a year afterwards thanking me for the you know the tour that we did and and that type of thing i would sometimes stay late with with people and they would say well why don't you join us for dinner and <laughs> I, yeah and you know we'd go to, and i'd go okay you know and we would go and you know they would take me to like you know um uh what was the one that i can't think of the name of the restaurant is right above it uh long gone now but anyway uh we would go up there and eat and all that kind of stuff so you know, it's just, you know, people appreciated it. And, uh, and there's a few of them that I remember because they weren't nice. Um, the one I can remember was uh, I had taken some people through. We were about three quarters of the way through the tour. And the woman said, just stop. Stop. I said, what's the matter? She says, that fake Southern accent you got is just making me sick. Do you have anything, do you have anybody else that can finish this tour because I can't listen to you anymore. And so, I, yeah, so I went downstairs and there was a, a lady named Mary Montgomery that finished the tour for me. And uh, so she says, I can't believe they would do that. Too. So by the same token, there were a lot of people nice or a lot of people that, that were not nice. And, you know, that one really got me. It's like I mean, my Southern accent, you can't stand. She says, it's so fake. And so put on, she says, do you do that for everybody that you take through the house? I said, oh, hey, this is the way I talk. And so anyway, uh, Mary finished the tour up for me. So, you know, she says, she says, you just go calm down and, and I'll take care of this. So, 
Yeah, I did. have to calm down after that too. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And it's like, wow, you know, I've never been talked to like that. And uh, wow. so, oh yeah. I, I feel like really more what I've had, but I've also worked at numerous plantations at this point. It's been yeah. a lot more um, like inappropriate comments in regard to the history that are like making make staff uncomfortable and other visitors uncomfortable. I've had situations where visitors start fighting visitors. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have that. I used to get tired of people ringing the doorbell and asking me if Tom was home. That one got really old and it was one day. Now I would be fired for this today. So I can tell this now because I think the statutes of limitations run out of and I just said, I don't know, let me go look. And I just closed the door and walked down the hallway. And one of my coworkers says, you're not going back, are you? I said, nope. And I didn't. Well, when I left the Wolf House, I worked for Finkelstein's Pawn Shop for a few years. Oh. And that was different. <laughs> and enjoyable, but different. And um, uh, right down to the day that somebody threw a Jimmy John sandwich at us because of, because he was mad at us. There was, a, there was always, no matter where you are, there's always something interesting that happens. <laughs> Uh, I don't waste there. the sandwich. Don't waste the sandwich. But he opened the door and threw the sandwich at us because he was mad about somebody that they didn't give him enough on his pawn or whatever. <laughs> it was that was a different place. Uh, you haven't lived to you that you, you've worked in a pawn shop. It's quite an education. I enjoyed. I was there three years, um, and then I left. and And uh, mom was getting uh, up in years and not doing well. So I really uh, spent a, a lot of time kind of looking after her. Uh, when she got into a nursing home, then I went to work at Biltmore as a, a range safety officer on their sporting clays range. Um, mm-hmm. I got, uh, I didn't get this there, but I, I did a lot of damage to one of my shoulders and had to have a lot of surgery on it, but I couldn't work. So when the pandemic hit, they started clearing the rosters out there, trying to, you know, to pare things down as, as you might well imagine. And, and my part-time job was one of the ones that went. Mm-hmm. So that was, uh, I really hadn't worked in about, yeah, I mean, uh, almost two years. I, I, I left in August of 19. So here we are in April of, of 21. So almost a year. So then I, I, uh, I just needed a little part-time something just to kind of shake off all the, the stuff that, you know, just uh, being sitting for the last year, year plus. So yeah. I'm uh, working out and doing some work in there in the conservatory for him now uh, and a couple of days a week. And so this is more back to what I was doing at the Wolf House is talking to them about the it's, it's basically looking after the like the little uh, G gauge trains that, that they've got in the conservatory is, is maintaining those. But you find that you're during the day, you're answering questions about the Vanderbilts and about the conservatory and about the estate. And so um, this this is this is getting pretty close back to doing, you know, uh, what I would say, some interpretive work. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I, and I found out that I really enjoy being back with, 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 you know, talking to some of the visitors now I've been at it just a short period of time. And yeah. this is kind of a self-limiting job uh, as far as time, but it's kind of nice to be back talking to some of the visitors. I don't go up to the wolf house because I would probably look at something and think, well, what are you doing? And Tom is faced with a whole different set of problems than I am. And, you know, the solutions that work for me. 25 years ago are no longer valid. So, you know, I don't, I don't go around cause I, I just, you know, it's just, just not one of those things I enjoy doing. I always loved when we got the blue shirts that they came out with the one, the one I had, the collar was not sewn on right. And there was like four inches of collar on one side and like two inches on the other. That was my favorite shirt. I wore it all the time simply because it was a state issued shirt. It's, what's the matter with your collar? It came from the factory this way. Um, so I will say the blue shirts are better now than they were in the past. So I yeah. had the really bad blue ones, like you're talking about when I worked at Stagville. And yeah. I remember, cause like my shoulder, you know, the lines right here. And then yeah. it was actually like, oh, like yeah. <laughs> I know, but that collar, I, and when I kept looking at what is wrong with this? And it's like, it wasn't sewn on right, but they got a quality control problem. They're but, definitely better now. Thank goodness. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that's good. But yeah, but you know, Emily, I, I enjoyed all of it. You know, I, I look mm-hmm. back at it and there's a lot of people regret a lot of stuff, but there's very little I regret on it. And uh, yeah. there's, it, it, it's, I look back and, and um, I, I guess I have to look back on it. We did good work 
And uh, I literally left the place, you know, uh, I think I, I like to think that my presence up there made a huge difference in, in how, how the Wolf House is, has fared and survived through the years. And, uh, you know, it's it's a uh, um, I don't look back with any regrets on anything that I did or didn't do. It's a uh, I think sometime I could have been a little bit more understanding uh, of, of, of some of the, the things that were, you know, that were told me. Well, like I said, you, you are a legend. Everybody um, <laughs> Thank speaks you. highly of you. And I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me today, um, go through your memories and yeah. share information with us. Yeah, it was fun. You know, it was, it was a huge part of my life and, and it was, it was very enjoyable. Okay. So, but no lie, you need me, if I can ever come out there and help you with anything, you give me a call. I appreciate it. I got time on my hands. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll let you go and I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you in a bit then. Enjoy. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.